Sí, sí, sí. All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the January uh, Development Control Committee meeting. Um, as we have got members of the public in the building, I'd just like to say welcome. And if you need facilities, they are through that door to the left-hand side. If there is an emergency, any alarms that go off, it will be for real. So there's a door at the rear and a door at the front if you can exit and assemble in the car park. Other than that, I have a notice to read out. In accordance with the openness of local bodies regulations 2014, this meeting is being live streamed and may otherwise be recorded, filmed or communicated on other social media platforms. The recording of this meeting will be made available on the council's YouTube short channel shortly after the meeting. Both councillors and officers in attendance are reminded to make full use of and speak clearly into the microphones available at all times. A reminder that mobile phones should be turned off or put on silent mode. Those present at the meeting should refrain from taking telephone calls. Thank you. <clears throat> right. Apologies for absence. Apologies for absence to be received from Councillor Joshi, Councillor Jeffrey Kaufman. Councillor Lindsay Bordley, Councillor Frank Bordley, Councillor Cole. Thank you. Any appointment of substitutes? None have been made. Any declarations of interest? No, it'll be only me then. I would just like to declare, just for reasons of transparency, that my daughter lives just outside the red line of the application on Turville Close. Um, but I don't believe I have any prejudicial interest and I have taken legal advice and been told I don't have any prejudicial interest in this. So I'm quite happy to remain in the meeting. Minutes of the previous meeting, may I sign? Thank you. All right, will we, we move to the agenda item? which is Land East of Welford Road, Wigston, Leicestershire. We have two speakers. Mrs. Barford, would you like to give your speak? You have five minutes and I'll give you a nod when you've got one minute left. Chair for the opportunity to speak in relation to this application. David Wilson Holmes is proud to be one of the UK's largest house builders and a part of our company is a commitment to providing sustainable, high quality family housing. It is considered that the proposals before you today represent sustainable, deliverable, and inclusive development that will assist the local planning authority in the delivery of much needed housing. The site forms part of the Wigston direction of the growth area which is allocated for a mixed-use residential led scheme under policy 20 of the adopted local plan. The principle of the proposed development is established by this allocation. Whilst the proposal only seeks outline consent, we have worked extensively with the council to create a master plan that demonstrates how the site can achieve the ambitions and requirements set by policy 20. The master plan proposes an average density of 32 dwellings per hectare, which is in accordance with the national and local planning policy and is sufficiently sustainable for land. Primary school, community facilities, and local centre lie at the heart of a wider development with employment land located to the south of the site. A design guide will be submitted, secured by a condition, to ensure the delivery of high quality, detailed design. The proposed development will also fulfil the outstanding requirement of affordable housing meaning that the direction of the growth allocation as a whole will deliver 20% affordable dwellings. Development significantly overprovides on the requirement for public open space. The proposals will retain and enhance the existing public right of way through the site and will provide local residents with a vast network of new and on and off road pedestrian and cycle routes, enabling access across the wider site. The public open space will also provide play areas and access links to phase one development. The master plan has been designed to avoid development within the most sensitive areas of the site. We acknowledge that there has been some concern with regards to the potential 
the commercial mask of the Barn Hall Meadow Local Wildlife Site to facilitate the development. Leicester County Council Ecologists confirm that this partial mask is acceptable, subject to mitigation in the form of a biodiversity management plan, and do not object to the proposals. Furthermore, the principle of this partial loss for the access road was previously established under the Outline Plan Commission granted for the Phase 1 development. For the avoidance of doubt, no housing will be constructed within the Barn Hall Meadow local wildlife site. The detailed proposals will include on-site measures to improve biodiversity, including habitat retention, creation and enhancement, in accordance with Local Plan Policy 37 and the aims of the MPPF. The full impact on biodiversity cannot be determined until the reserve mass stage. However, in the event of any net loss, this will be appropriately mitigated off-site for a financial contribution secured by the Section 106 agreement. This approach has been agreed with Leicester County Council of Ecology and the Borough Council. The development will provide a number of highway benefits, including the link road connecting the new to the roundabout with the Welford Road roundabout, to provide a comprehensive development with Phase 1, and off-site improvements to the local transport network. Leicester County Highways have no objections to the proposals. A Section 106 agreement is currently being drafted to mitigate the impacts of the proposals that includes contributions towards the provision of a new primary school on site, funding for special schools, healthcare, libraries, a public transport strategy, air quality and biodiversity net gain. In summary, the proposals are considered to satisfy the three objectives of sustainable development and will ensure the delivery of future homes and infrastructure within the borough. The site is allocated within phase two growth area, and there are no technical objections to the proposals. We therefore fully support the planning officer's recommendation and respect, respectfully request that members give favourable consideration to this application. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could I ask you to go and sit at the back, please? Thank you very much for that. Our next speaker is Councillor Charlesworth. You also have five minutes, and I'll give you a nod when you've got one minute left. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I speak as County Councillor for the area of the application, and also as Ward Councillor, because this is the adjacent ward and most directly affected. I'm not against development in Oakley and Wixton because the borough needs to grow for various reasons. I do see the benefits of this application, which include better bus services, affordable housing. The removal of the 40 mile, mile per hour stretch on Welford Road, adjustment of the new mini roundabout near the railway bridge, and more people to potentially go to Wixton Town Centre, which is struggling. But these positive aspects do not negate the negative impact on our work, of which there are several. The S106 contribution of £329,000 for the Two Steeples Medical Centre will not help an already overcapacity health centre. There are two crossings proposed for Cook Slane, which is a single track road with no footpaths. It is a well-used walking lane for many in the area. The two new crossings are to be designed to discourage cars from turning left or right into Cook Slane. This will not work. If drivers can find a shortcut, they will, and the volume of traffic, of traffic on Cook Slane will ruin the verges and make it unusable for pedestrians and effectively kill off a recreational area. As part of the scheme in 2013, the first phase, a joint cycle footpath was installed on Newton Lane. This is now used as a car park in area for residents. The agenda papers mention several mitigation measures that were part of phase one. It's important to mention phase one because what has happened from that will reflect on phase two. Some of these have been carried out and have made absolutely no difference to the intensity of traffic in this area. This brings me on to my first real area of concern. 
The references to highways issues in your papers bear no relation to the local highway authority responses and assessment that I was sent in December. It says in your papers on page 22 that the transport assessment takes into account the impact of 650 dwellings, a school, employment development, and the cumulative impact of other developments, of which there are several in the area. The methodology used by the RHA is based on the completion of only 325 completed dwellings, which is a fraction of the existing and proposed development in this area. It identifies the junctions that will be severely impacted and proposes measures to resolve these issues. But the only concrete proposal is to put traffic lights at the All Saints Church junction. It offers no real solutions to the Wakes Road roundabout or the junction of Bullhead Street and Newton Lane. Local residents already know how congested boosting becomes at these times, and this will only get worse with this development. I wrote to the leader of the county council and the lead member for highways asking them to help with this issue. And the only help we are to get is a little tinkering with junctions and roundabouts. Air pollution will only, will only get worse with more standing traffic. My second area of concern is we are not following our own policies. I should say I have borne in mind the strategic growth plan and the duty to cooperate. Opening Wixon's adopted core strategy says that their housing requirement from 2006 to 2026 is 1,800 dwellings, and of this 1,800, 452 should come from the direction to growth there. Phase one brought forward 450. On one minute left. And another 70 following amendments to that application. There were two other developments of 53 and 36 dwellings in the direction to growth area. There was another for 43 adjacent to this area, St. Petrops. And there is an application for another 39 near the railway bridge. All of these, along with the proposed 650 before you tonight, brings a total to 1,341 dwellings in one area. This is too much. Local services such as dentists and doctors are already struggling to cope with demand. The road network is at capacity in places, green fields are disappearing at an alarming rate, and we are quite literally becoming the suburban message city. This development is not in the interest of opening with the residents. I have done a survey of residents who have completed phase one development, and 88% have migrated from the city, 5% from other areas, and 7% from the borough itself. I've got one sentence. Uh, I'm afraid you're going to have to finish there, Councillor Charlesworth. I would respectfully ask you to refuse this application. There is please, no Councillor answer. Charlesworth, please. You know the rules. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Watterson, would you like to present your report, please? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Count. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillors. Um, good evening. I'm presenting to you this evening the planning application for the second phase of the Weeks and Direction for Growth. The full description of development is for the I'm not pointing that one. Uh, the outline planning application for the demolition of existing agricultural buildings and residential development of up to 650 dwellings, a new local centre and community facilities, land for employment uses, a primary school site, areas of public open space for giving children to play, landscaping and drainage infrastructure, together with a link road through the site connecting the existing Welford Road roundabout with the phase one development. It is located at Shane, um, to the south and east of Phase 1, uh, south towards the railway line and west towards Welford Road. The site is uh, 40.89 hectares in area and currently most agricultural fields separated by hedgerows and trees. The site is allocated in the local plan as shown uh, on the plan in front of you in the orange shade roughly in the middle of your screen. And the phase one showed in grey, surrounding it roughly to the north, with the employment area to the south bounding the railway line. To highlight the location in relation to its surroundings and in relation to the local road networks. 
uh, shown on the plan in front of you. Pretty much that comment using all I uh, catch up. So this is the site master plan that's referred to. The north of the site includes land for a primary school, local centre including a community facility and an expansion of the already approved allotments from phase one. And you can see that in the dark orange and the bright yellow, again, just to the right of the center of the screen. Um, it would also include a play area and link closely to the recreational area and green space from phase one, reflecting existing field boundaries. And retain trees, giving a green heart, again, with play facilities surrounded by a mix of residential development. Main Spine Road uh, runs through this area. Uh, north towards phase one into Newton Lane and west across Cook's Lane. More residential in this area with about 2.5 hectares of employment land to the south bound in the railway line. Um, and the protected wildlife site areas. Um, and then the, the access road up to the new uh, roundabout on Welford Road, which we've already referred to. Landscape strategy. So to retain, tree, retain trees and hedgerows where possible with additional planting in those key locations and strengthening existing. There are a number of drainage areas across the site for the natural contours of the land. The landscape strategy relates closely to the open space strategy and we have worked carefully with the applicant to ensure um, additional allotment provision uh, and then the appropriate levels of informal open space, formal park space and equipped areas for play and the scheme is policy compliant. In fact, as mentioned, it does over provide on the whole for the level of informal open space across the whole site. So on the whole, a very, very a great green uh, development. The landscape strategy also intrinsically links to ecology considerations. This plan shows the retention of as much as possible of the Barnpool Meadow and the Cooks Lane past your local wildlife sites, notwithstanding the road um, just impacting on that slightly. We've liaised very carefully with the county ecologist, including the site visit and a survey of both of those sites. This concluded that both should retain their designations, but that a minor loss could be accommodated, balanced with a suitable management plan and mitigation. So the applicant in their submission sets out that there will be an overall loss of around 128 habitat units, and that the on-site measures and the on-site landscape strategy can mitigate to the tune of about 104 units. So the applicant has agreed to a section 106 contribution to offset the remaining 23 or so units, and that's part of the recommendation. Um, the other element of that is a condition that will seek to maximise the on-site mitigation uh, through that biodiversity management plan accordingly. So the push is to maximise the potential for on-site and the balance will then be, will be mitigated with a contribution to the council. Um, I'm aware that there is a local petition uh, running at about 1,200 signatories. It's documented in my report. Any details in response to the key points of that petition? I'm confident that the management plan and the section 106 address all the concerns. Um, and this is based on confirmation with the county ecologists. I'm advised by the applicant that the biodiversity master plan for phase one is being fully implemented. Um, there is some criticism in the petition directed to the council in terms of the condition of these sites, but ultimately they remain in private ownership and their management and maintenance therefore falls um, out with the control of the council. There was also criticism directed to lack of engagement with extensive site notices, over 1,200 neighbourhood notification letters and the applicant's uh, community consultation exercise undertaken. Pre application, I'm really confident that more than adequate engagement has taken place. Concluding this point, I would note that an informative is included that also requires the applicant to engage with the petition leader and um, to inform the preparation of that biodiversity management plan as required under the condition. And together with the section 106, I'm therefore comfortable very much so with the position on ecology. Turning to movement, you can see the hierarchy of routes from the Spine Road running north south and that's out to uh, to Welford Road. Uh, which also forms the bus route, the secondary routes, and then the streets and the lanes. Uh, there is a footpath on the property right of way, which runs roughly north south, and a condition is required for its inclusion and improvement in the overall development. 
um, relating to connectivity more generally. Um, you can see how the site uh, links to phase one to the north and the roundabouts on Newton Lane and Welford Road. Um, you want to you note um, the, the councillor has talked about the links across Cook's Lane. Um, and this will link to the current application for the further 38 dwellings. And I will come back to that in a second. And that red circle uh, in the center is added by myself um, to identify that those additional links that are required by condition to link into that playing field area. Um, as part of phase one, and that, that uh, condition will ensure there's maximum connectivity between those key areas and also linking to the community facility, linking to that recreational space. Queries have been indeed been raised at Cook's Lane. They are detailed in your reports. Um, it was a concern that I had at, at when we first received the application and we wanted to make sure that Cook's Lane is not used as an access solution to the site. The transport assessment um, discounts that. It's not part of the access solution as a whole, which we've, we've talked about. And we want to make sure that its character is retained. The applicant has suggested a scheme that will help mitigate this. And one of the examples is shown there. It means Cook's Lane has right of way. The radii are constricted so that it doesn't become a natural action to turn left. There are speed humps in advance. And give way signs on advance um, to that junction between the road and uh, Cook's Lane, there are two of these designed in a similar way. I think this is a great start. However, I don't think it goes quite far enough. So we've added an additional condition that specifically requires a more comprehensive design solution at reserve matters stage. And that will be developed in, a, in accordance with county highways as well, of course. I'd like to turn to some matters of detail. Um, on some of the highway schemes. And first of all, I understand uh, that Welford Road Junction has caused problems quite recently. Um, and uh, in relation to before this scheme as part of phase one, it has been agreed under section 278 agreement. So it kind of falls out with this application itself. However, to make sure that the revised section 278 scheme, which is shown on the plan, is implemented, that is conditioned in. And the scheme includes some amended curb lines new bollards to make sure that the traffic is um, doing what it's supposed to do um, and making sure that that scheme is as safe as possible and that scheme like i said has already been agreed with county highways because it's kind of a um part of the legacy of phase one as opposed to today but we've conditioned it in to be absolutely sure that it's implemented um, the application also takes into account the potential of changing the speed limit on welfare roads to 30 uh, right through to Kilbert Bridge and there's a section 106 contribution required to pay for the traffic regulation order to be instigated to research this further. That's very much in conjunction with county highways and also the local police to make sure that that is an appropriate speed limit. But the money is uh, required through the 106 to take that, absolutely take that a step further with a view to having that implemented. In terms of highways impact itself, the transport assessment concluded that the scheme would take three key junctions uh, severely over capacity, two of which are already there. These are the Wakes Road Roundabout, uh, Bullhead Street and Moat Street Junction, and the Moat Street, Long Street, Bush End Junction. We have worked extensively over a number of months with the county and with the applicant to mitigate that impact to make the development acceptable, and the three junction designs are conditioned in accordingly. Uh, Wakes Road Roundabout, firstly, uh, see some additional capacity created. You can see the yellow areas on the plan in front of you uh, with some, uh, some additional carriageway space and some curb line amendments to increase the capacity on that junction. Similarly, at Bullhead Street, um, the, the widening of the carriageway to increase capacity through that junction. And um, lastly, at Long Street, um, an optioneering approach has been undertaken, and that concluded that the traffic light control junction is the best solution. And you can see an indicative scheme uh, on the slide in front of you. And this, in effect, um, adds more than adequate capacity for this junction moving forward. So it actually over provides in relation to the impact of the scheme itself. So I might add that the first two schemes are part of the CELT scheme, which you'll be familiar with in terms of looking more strategically at the highway network. Those two schemes have been designed by county and absolutely confident working with county that those amendments that you've seen uh, accommodate the impact of the development 
um, providing, and that's right through, I might add, for the entire development, not 325 dwellings. So that's the whole impact phase over a period of time. So um, the conditions that cover all the highways, ecological, ecological environmental matters, uh, also on construction management. There is a design guide uh, which will address sustainability, including electrical vehicle charging and so on. That's a very similar approach that we took to implementation of phase one. We have kind of up the policy requirements in accordance with a more sustainable development, the MPPS, and the updated local plan since our first application was decided. So in conclusion, the proposal is well established in policy, the local plan. It's fundamental in the delivery against the of the virus planning and housing strategies, and indeed housing delivery to meet the res to meet local residents' needs. There are no material considerations that indicate that the application should be refused. And all impacts are suitably mitigated through the conditions in the section 106 requirements as detailed in the report and indeed the addendum paper in front of you. Um, so in turn, the conditions that we've imposed in the section 106 will of course guide that future reserve matters application process, which will follow, uh, which should follow if this decision is granted this evening. So it's therefore recommended that subject to the signing of the section 106 agreement, the plan permission should be granted. Thank you, Mr. Watson. And I just remind the committee and everybody here that we are looking at the principle of the development. If we actually give permission for the principle, it does not mean the development can go ahead. That has to come back on the reserve matters when all of the things that Mr. Watson has talked about have to be finalized and acceptable. So we're looking at the principle of the development as it's an outline application. We are looking at the principle, the quality and character of the development proposed, the sustainability and climate change, provision of affordable housing, highways impact, ecology, provision of open space, mitigation of noise impacts from the railway line. Where there are any material considerations that indicate that the development should not be permitted. So we're looking at the outline application only. <coughs> okay. Could I just ask a couple of things before we go to Councillor Lloydle? Um, I know one of the main concerns is Cook's Lane, and it's always been a main concern of mine. I've always tried my best to protect that place because I use it regularly myself for walking myself and my dogs. Um, are we absolutely certain and happy that the prevention of traffic will go to the reserve matters and they will come up with a viable solution that does not only deter people from using Cook's Lane, but actually stops them. Because that's what I want to see. I want people to be able to travel down Cook's Lane and not turn into the new development, travel through the new development and not turn into Cook's Lane. Personally, I don't want them deterred. I want them stopped. So I think that really, really seriously needs looking at. I know people have concerns about the highways and yes, Wakes Road Island has been over capacity for, well, as far as I'm concerned, since they actually put the traffic lights on it, because as far as I was concerned, it was fine before then. But we need to look into that a little bit more. Um, Bullhead Street, I'm not too sure about traffic lights myself, especially outside of a grade one listed building. Um, but I, as I nearly got run over there the other day, I'm quite happy for traffic to be controlled a little bit better. Um, so we will now move to Councillor Lloydle. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I think that I hate outline planning applications because they always seem to be piecemeal and wheedling through. And when we get to reserve matters, we're then told, oh, well, you pass that at outline and we've got no compact. So I, I loathe outline planning applications. Um, this one has an awful lot of issues involved. Um, you're quite right, Chair. Nothing will mitigate 
in highways the fact that we're going to have a minimum of over a thousand more cars hit our road in one particular area of the borough. And it will be a minimum of a thousand with 650 houses, because you can guarantee that in the three <coughs> bedrooms, there's going to be at least three, if not four cars. So I can't see how they can mitigate by doing all this road works at Woodhead Street and the, the various islands. Um, and if anything is to go by with that island that has been constructed at Kilby Bridge, you might as well give up now with highways because it's lethal. And I know you're saying that they're going to put some work in there to try and make it safer. How on earth did they ever manage to get that through in the first place? Anybody could see that it's a dangerous construction of an island. Um, so I, I beg of belief sometimes with highways and, and what they're actually about. I've got a number of things here. Some of them are um, comments. Uh, I will try and make them into questions so that you can answer. Firstly, it's already been spoken about the number of houses. The first phase was supposed to be 450 which rose to well over 500. Had that come in the first place, we would have had a different outcome, especially with various things that we were asking for to go in phase one. We now have the second development of 650, which does trigger, thankfully, various additives for the site. Is it possible to condition that we don't have any more amendments come forward, which will then be able to alter the plan to get even more houses squashed onto that site? That's, that's a question. I know what you're going to tell me. Secondly, one of the biggest bugbears I have and this planning authority know, we're looking at outline, but they will already have their houses put into the reserve matters. They already know what they're going to put in there and what they can squash into this site. I am pushing once again for the inclusion of bungalows on this site. The developers have got to be told not asked, told, we require bungalows, we will have bungalows. If we don't get bungalows at Reserve Matters, well, I'm not going to say what I will do, but we will have bungalows, please. Se secondly, I am disappointed. The speaker said that this was a sustainable development. And on page 19, they talk about sustainability and climate. And they talk about all the right wording, all the things that could go into this site. And then it follows on with a paragraph which says, but none of them are taking place. The applicant's position is disappointing. However, their position is fully justified. How can it be justified? If they're going to have all these things, if it's going to be sustainability and it's going to meet climate change and then they don't put anything in that actually meets it, how can you say it is justified? I've talked talk about the highways. I'm concerned about that speed cushion on page 23, which is the one that goes on to put flame. Chair, you've already alluded to it. I don't see how they can come up with a speed cushion that stops people 
drivers going yeah. onto a road. I think that's just to slow them down towards the junction. I think a barrier is the only thing that will slow them down because we have speed cushions around the borough. It doesn't stop certain drivers. It doesn't deter them. So that is a real concern, um, that speed cushion. And, and I think you're quite right, Chair. It's got to be something that stops the crossing going over that. Um, I was very pleased to see in your report that you put in about the, the housing set by government. Some of the residents quite rightly are concerned about extra housing. We all need extra houses. It'd be interesting to see, Chair, how many people who signed the petition actually live in the new houses that have been built in phase one. Because people want housing, but they don't want to have other houses near them. Um, and that would be very interesting to see. The government sets the housing, not us. I had to defend this situation at a forum I was at a few weeks ago, where it was raised that the council have put 650 houses on this site. No, we haven't. The government have actually stipulated that we have housing. The government have set the numbers for the borough, and so it's not down to this council. In the condition on page 34, you talk about flood lighting of this area during working times. I would like to see that there is a condition put in there about the timing of that flood lighting and then make sure that it is switched off. Very often the timings of flood lighting is overlooked. We do that. Um, the other one is the bus stops around the site. Would it be possible to stipulate that these bus stops are put into laybys around the site? We know it's going to be busy. We know there's going to be a lot of cars there. We have a real problem on the Blavy Road. We did ask for developers on the Blavy Road to put a bus stop in a lay-by. They couldn't possibly do it because of the utilities and it causes terrible congestion with the buses parked on the road. So would it be possible at this stage to make sure that there was insets for the buses and that they're not stopping actually on the road? On page 35, you talk about the air quality and that it will be monitored for three months beforehand. Is there any prov provision for the air quality to then to be continually monitored after this? Because we realise, if you've got any sense, we realise there is going to be an increase in car movements and the air quality, especially around um, the bottom of, um, it's not Kelmarsh Avenue, Newton Lane, that uh, it's going to have a serious effect upon all the residential developments that are already there. So I'd like to see some provision for a continued air quality. Um, I think I will stop. You've run out of things to say. Well, I've got one or two other things, but I, I've, I've asked enough questions. Okay. Thank you. And Mr. Watterson, could you answer them? The first one was, uh, can we condition any amendments to the number of housing? If I may, Chair, Council, I'll go back. Good question. You talked about housing and planning applications. So just to maybe remind everyone, it is that application is kind of in principle. principle. The local plan sets the principle for the whole development. The outline kind of takes that principle to another level, and the reserve matters will come in on the on the detail. It could the applicant is absolutely uh, uh, able to come in with the whole lot. So it's interesting. Just one fell swoop, or could do it in phases, and that that you have no control over how the applicant chooses to make those applications or a series thereof. 
and the nature of the housing market is that those may change over time and you may need to amend them. Unfortunately, what you can't do is to limit those numbers. And by saying you can't, you, you, you can't restrict the applicant from making applications in the future, you have to um, determine the applications to land with you. You can choose to refuse them with decent grounds, um, but you can't restrict uh, the number of uh, dwellings. And indeed, on phase one, you will see how that's changed over time, um, how house types change, how demand changes, and that is just the nature of the house. So, so unfortunately, the answer to the, to the question, uh, Councillor, is you can't restrict the applicant um, from trying to amend stuff in the future. I'll stop you from asking. I'm just the, answering the question. Um, and, and sorry if I'm teaching you to suck eggs, I know you know how the planning system works, but maybe for the public as well to, to explain the processes that, that, um, that we have to go through. Put your mic on. You raised a lot of questions. Hopefully, I'll cover them more than but please do remind me if I've missed any out. Um, you talked about sustainability as a whole. Um, sustainability is about environmental, and social, and economic. It's providing homes, it's providing jobs. It's got a significant amount of um, some sustainability criteria. Now, I wrote the report, and it's a shame that I view that the applicant can't be encouraged to, to do better. Scheme doesn't improve on uh, it meets uh, building regs. Indeed, it, 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 it beats the building regulation requirements. So really, with policy, that is as far as you can push the developer as it currently stands. Uh, the Environment Bill has been passed, but it's not enacted in the Planning Act, so we can't push the developer to, in two years' time, you'll have a lot more hooks. A lot more hooks to push developers and applicants on. But as it stands, um, I absolutely think that we push the developers as hard as possible particularly in the area of biodiversity net gain, um, which the applicants agreed to. But also don't forget, you know, applying jobs, applying houses, a bus route running through the site, there is masses of green infrastructure or retaining trees. So I think there is a significant amount of uh, sustainable credentials of the overall scheme. Uh, and like I said, that will get stronger in the future. And I really, I genuinely believe that. Um, the... Um, you talk about bungalows, I refer to that in my committee report. Uh, and absolutely, there is an opportunity to provide bungalows as part of the scheme, but as outline stage, it wouldn't be appropriate for us to uh, to address that in detail. So that comes in your housing types. It could come as part of the overall offer on affordable housing or as part of the detailed layout. And that will come in through that reserve matter. But again, through this process, we can't enforce what those house types will be in the future. Um, I think... We were talking about the uh, claim junction and speed cushions and bollards. Saying, I have explained um, that the scheme in front of you is just an indicative scheme. I share your concerns and I ask the applicant how they propose to address the dominance of Cook's Lane, not using it as an access, retaining its character as part of that footpath network as well, the formal public rights of way. And I want you to be assured that a solution can be found that will stop traffic. Um, as far as legally possible, from using Cook's Lane as an access route. Um, so what's in front of you is an addictive scheme, so what could be done? I have the view that more needs to be done, and that's why there's a quite strict condition in there, saying that's a great starting point, but I want to see more. more. And the, um, the county council is absolutely behind that, and they concur with that recommended um, condition, which require that detail to really come through working with county to make sure that that scheme is as solid as possible to retain that character. That links in with the other condition about the improvement to the public right of way. Which is, of course, will address that the, 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 the section of Cook's Lane that falls between um, the two crossing points, the Spine Road and the access back up into phase one heading north south. Um, you talked about bus stops as well and where you can have lay rights. Again, a matter of reserve matters. I would just point out that um, there is a mixed school of thought whether lay rights are good or bad. Um, and in fact, some people may argue the contrary to what you suggested in that if you don't have a lay-by, you are giving the bus priority over the car. Which is absolutely right and proper, because the bus doesn't have, ever have to wait to pull out into that flow of traffic. So really, we should be thinking there is a school of thought that you shouldn't be having lay -bys at all anywhere. Because you are taking the bus off the highway and slowing down its routing and prioritising the car. So again, either way, it's a matter of reserve matters not to be addressed through this process. 
and finally air quality. I want to finish with a, a very positive answer to your, to your point. Um, yes, there is a requirement for air quality monitoring to be undertaken with the submission of the reserve matter, the first reserve matter. There is also uh, a requirement which would be to the tune of, uh, from memory, and it's not confirmed, around 30,000 to contribute to the council's air quality monitoring with a new monitoring station, and obviously that will fall into the council's fusion monitoring processes of air quality in the area. That detail will come through the section 106. There's also a question about flood lighting. Flood lighting, my apologies. Um, I think that there is adequate covering of um, flood lighting along with the hours of, of operation within uh, the construction management plan. But if you would like additional detail to be put in, I'm sure that that could be uh, an amendment to that condition. Councillor Lloyd. Um, Chair, if you um, are happy that that <laughs> is fully a comprehensive condition, we have had problems in the past when flood lighting has been mentioned as a condition, but it's not actually been stipulated at the timings. We have had problems. If you're happy with that, then I will go along with that. But, you know, it, it's important mm. that we have flood lighting, but it's also switched off. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Bolter. Thank you, Chair. One of the problems of being on the committee with Mrs. Loyal is that um, we've been together for too long. So the points that she's picked up, I also picked up, but uh, I won't bore you with going through them all again because it'd be a waste of a bit of time. Um, one thing that does concern me is the bus service. It's a commercial service. How can you make sure that you're going to run bus service through there? You know, that's, that's probably one of the problems. Um, we've got one company that runs a bus service in Wixton at the moment. Um, I know you've had talks with them, because I've heard about that. But um, there's no compulsion for them to do that. You can't control commercial service. Um, yeah, housing numbers, yes. It, let's be honest, nobody sitting around this table wants more houses than they actually have to put in the bottom. It's, the number is set by central government. We merely have to provide the land to put them on. Uh, and that's one of the problems is that, you know, we can't turn around and say no. Uh, my colleague behind me said refuse the application. There's no grounds to refuse the application. Um, there's no material reasons why it can be refused, unfortunately. I'd like to know how we got from 600 to 650 at this stage. Looking at phase one, that was it, that number was increased. And this one's gone from 600 to 650. What about your bottom dog? By the time it all goes through, it'll be all the 650 built on this site. So is there any way we can control the numbers? I think that was already explained. I know, but I'll ask you the question again because I'm not going to give time the second time around. That's why I'm. Well, I've written down your first answer, so I'm making sure it's the same. Make it one round. Um, but it's still no. <laughs> I'll keep trying, Joe. I'll keep trying. Keep trying. Some positives is the 30 mile an hour speed limit going forward. We've talked about the ridiculous island at Kilby Bridge. Number of times I've seen cars going the wrong side of the island and going through there is unbelievable. Um, we thought we'd learn from the island at South Wixton, didn't we? Yes, we did. Exactly the same thing there. A couple of years later, they're going to build another one at Kilby Bridge. It's exactly the same. I wonder why I had a problem. Then everybody will learn, will they? We talked about trees on the site. To my knowledge, most of the trees on that site are ash trees, which at the moment are. Um, suffering somewhat by ash dieback. So I wonder how many percentages are going to be left at the end of the day, and are we going to insist that new trees are planted, they succumb to the uh, ash dieback. Do you want those questions answering? Uh, I'll keep, keep going if you mind, don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have the flood lighting, fine. Um, Cook's name I'm also concerned about, but I'm also concerned, I'm going to take it up tomorrow and this way let's do it today, is that they've already closed one of the rights of way of Cook's Lane, the new development on phase one. It's been blocked off. We went there today. It's been blocked off. 
It should have been reopened because it was blocked up previously. From the county to tell me if I permission to block it off. So somebody's got to look into that. I'd appreciate that. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Gill, I think it's got that job. Right, OK. Um, Just a very quick point on that, Councillor Bold. It very much depends on the nature of the closure because if it's a, a closure that is to facilitate the development, that can be dealt with by this authority. If it's a permanent closure and a rerouting, that's county. So I will make some inquiries tomorrow and get back to you. As far as I know, nobody's asked for that to be closed. It's already closed. Um, what am I ask going to do? Uh, archaeology on the site. Yes. Notice somewhere in the report, and forgive me, I'm not on the page now, some troll trenches are going to be dug about that. Um, I can assure you that this quite an ancient site. Mm -hmm. Many found, uh, things found on that, that land in past years. There was a, um, an asset found on there, you know, the asset found on there some years ago. I think that's in the museum at the present time. So concerned about disturbances of that and make sure that's done properly future generations. Okay. Leave it there, let somebody else have a go. Are uh, you... Mr. Watson, could you ask the questions regarding the bus service? Uh, yes, the bus service uh, did cause a significant debate during the determination of the, determination of the application. And the public transport provision has been dealt differently from phase one to phase two. This is down to county, not down to the, to the borough. Um, at phase one, the applicant has had to pay a significant sum of money to implement to pay towards the county, implementing a highway to a public transport scheme over a five year period from the 300 and something occupation, I can't remember the exact number off the top of my head. Maybe we're about a third of the way towards that occupation number. For phase two, the application in front of you, it is there, it is down to the applicant to effectively procure that bus service at their own cost and then provide it for a given period of time. And that given period of time, and the, um, again, it will probably, probably be for five years and there's a, um, minimum service requirements set out uh, within that will be set out as part of that agreement so really phase one county providing it and paying for it via the 106 phase two the applicant has to pay for it direct now i don't um i can't really comment on whether i agree or not with the different approaches but there is an obligation to pay for a bus service for a significant amount of time across phases one and two councillor bold do you want to come back i can't yeah um this is an interesting one because um it used to get bus passes for a number of years for these people, complete not a waste of time. Um, to actually make them ride a bus, which is a far better solution. So I'm happy with, with that. Um, the other thing I got in the first time was the, uh, the maintenance of these areas. Now, looking back to a previous application at South Wixton, the maintenance of the common areas Instead of the developer paying an community sum to the council, it pushed a cost onto the households. You have to pay an annual maintenance fee for maintaining the, the roads and uh, any other things that are there. Now, that might be fine initially, but when houses are sold on time after time, people forget about all this. Now, unless somebody's told me differently, these charges are unlimited. Okay, um, that's an additional cost on the on the householder. Also, depends how the roads are laid out. Some are adopted highways and some unadopted. Now, if you happen to be on one of these dog legs, unadopted, a there's no street lighting. B, you're responsible for the drainage, the maintenance of that road surface, and you cannot get broadband because they won't go on private land to put broadband in. So any private dog legs that I have on Windlash Drive at South Wixton, those residents are now being penalised because they can't get broadband. So can that be looked at within this, the scheme of things as well? Um, but it does concern me that the cost 
is being pushed from the developer onto the householders forever and a day. You're going to tell me they can't deal with that at the present time. It's not going to raise it anyway. And this issue we have with these recently where the panel seven properties are released for, they're also looking at these management communities as well. And it's a national. I would, I would really come back to sort of say, in, in terms of uh, broadband and the issues you've raised uh, most lastly, Councillor, um, it's, it's not really part of the application process or the council's responsibility to, 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 to deal with the provision of broadband and so on. It's out with their statutory powers. So I can't really comment on that and whether the provider will go across um, lands that may not be under public control to provide that service. I'm sure if the market demand is there, then there'll be a way for them to provide it. So, um, Pass. I, I really can't answer. And I think it's not part of really this, this evening's discussion in terms of the uh, planning law whether or not we should address that. Can I just intercede there? I have just been informed regarding that sort of situation. It is a national problem and it's being looked at nationally, especially the bit about uh, maintenance agreements. Well, I totally agree with you because my mother lives down in South Wigston in the area you're talking about and is suffering from massive increases in prices. So it is being looked at, but we've got regard to broadband, broadband doesn't have to run underneath the roads. I have a caravan that doesn't have any cables running to it, but I get broadband through the air. Uh, Chair, with respect, but South Wigston, the problem at the moment is the fibre optics company doing that will not go on private land. No, but it's now been do, going to be done through the 5G network, isn't it? Yes. Because you know how many problems we're having with masks being installed where we don't want them installed yes. and cannot control it in any way, shape or form. I think you'll find a lot of it's going to end up going through that. Well, it just it's not something that we can control, unfortunately. I, I thought that would go anyway. I know, I know. Um, one of the things you did say, though, that needs answering, you talked about trees. Yeah. Ash trees and ash dieback, and whether any of the landscaping plan takes into account any of this, Mr. Watterson. I genuinely can't answer the question at this precise moment, but it's something I will take away and make sure that, um, with the submission of the full detailed landscape scheme, we'll have a tree planting plan. None of the trees are protected by TPA. They're not protected by the TPA. You can't require them to be replaced if they fall down. As part of the landscape plan, species where you can to make sure that you don't have the details you refer to in terms of that flyback and so on. Look at oak at the same time, will you? Yeah. Look at oak at the same time. It'll all be part of the landscaping plan. But one of the other things you did talk about was the archaeology. Now, I know for a fact, Councillor Bolter, that you probably buried some of these things. <laughs> <laughs> in, in the you ancient... Lost them ancient you lost them as old as that, Chair. <laughs> I, I totally agree with you. It is a significant area. We know there's archaeology under there. And uh, it will be looked into. And it's in the report that that is being done. And if you look at a Google Earth view, you can see where previous trenches have already been dug because they're great big strips that you can see across the fields. We all know it's there and it's got to be preserved. So it is being looked at. Uh, if I may, Chair, the, um... we did work with the archaeologists. We, we made sure that the trial trenching was undertaken. I'm pretty certain that Google Earth view is the trial trenching that we've just had undertaken. County archaeologists came back with some more comments, and that's why the, the, the an extra level of conditions in the report. That means we're going to go through that process. To make sure that we are addressing all those points. Councillor Bolton. Can we see the report, Chair? It's in the public domain. It's on the Council's website. On the website. Here we go again. Right. <laughs> But all of all of the I'm a dinosaur. I look at on paper. Things are on the website. I was looking at them previously. You have to use one of these, but it's, it's not connected to the cable network. Okay. Councillor Morris. Thank you, Chair. Um, whilst I realise this is for our planning application, uh, I do have some questions regarding it. But I also have uh, some points that I'd like to get on the radar. So I apologise that some of them. I know what you're going to say, but I want to get them in the radar, get them out there and recorded so, so they are taken forward. So starting start with the amendments to, to the roads. 
if we look at the amendment to the one of our church that we're talking about, um, talk about putting traffic lights there. Now, if you're at the bottom of Newton Lane to get to the council offices, five sets of traffic lights. Five sets of traffic lights, and what is that? Half a mile, three quarters of a mile, you've got to go through five sets of traffic lights. That's going to back the traffic up if, like Council Lloyd says, a thousand new cars mm -hmm. on the road. The amendments that you've put to Wakes Road or the McDonald's roundabout, it's minuscule, it's tiny. It looked that how, and I know it's not yourself, I know it's the highways. I always do it on a system. They get the qualifications at university, they type it into a, into a computer system, and it goes, This is what you need. There isn't no practical, you know, knowing what to do and visiting it. The, the amendments certainly from coming from Oldby turning into Wigston. The, the division of the lane, the little chop off, it's, it's going to affect nothing there. That needs to be further looked at because it backs up now. If you go there at five o'clock at night, it's backed up with everybody coming from OB heading towards Wigston. Five sets of traffic lights to get to Wigston College and get to the council offices. That's crazy for three quarters of a mile. Don't see how traffic lighting that roundabout is going to be beneficial to anybody. You'll back everybody up into the town centre, you'll back everybody up down, down Oak Street, and you'll back everybody up this way. And if you've got people cruising the crossings, it's going to be chaos. It really is. It's going to be standstill. South Winston, if you want an example of backed up traffic, look at all the traffic lights going from the college or from Tesco's going all the way to, to the garage on St Thomas's Road if you want to see traffic problems. So we've got to learn from there. The, the other question, of, one of the questions I've got is, you talk about outlining and you talked about piecemeal. So we know that the, the magic number is 500. For a school, if they do, if we give them outline permission and they come in and they do 200, 300, 200, whatever they, whatever they want to do, what is the knock on effects of that? Or is it the outline for 650 and that stays at 650? Is there any, basically, is there any wriggle room where they can get out of providing a new school, uh, local amenities and things like that? That is my worry because for numerous, numerous years I've banged on about how we need a school, we need it because it's saturated, you've got Tythor saturated. We've got Little Hill saturated. We've got the meadows saturated with a number of things. And just like the cars, if you've got a thousand cars and 650 homes, let's say there's going to be what? Should we say a thousand kids, a thousand young people coming into the borough? They're all going to filter into either Beecham or Winston College. We need to make sure that that is it. And just by giving extra money, where are the schools going to build? Are we going to get more mobile, mobile units put on as classrooms instead of actual real classrooms? We need to make sure that something's done with that. And with that for the school, is it possible to condition that the school must be built before the first person moves into phase two? Because I know that the builders will build it last because they want to make them money. They want to get people in their houses to recover their costs. I think that we should condition that the school is built before the first person moves in. That does not stop them building the houses that stops people moving in. Right. They can build all the houses they want, but the school, the first right. person moves in, has to be the money. It's not, it's so not about building. Get that up and running as quickly as possible. Mm. Save the title of the Little Hills, the Meadows, the All Saints, from taking what could be a 1,000 under the age of 11 children into our primary schools. It then gives the high schools so the a chance to promote, to take these to pupils as they go through year reception through to year six. But we need to have something there to take these kids kids on because otherwise they're already saturated. You've got 32 kids in a classroom. It is. Meadows, Meadows School can't build out. They're, they're surrounded. So we're at Tythorn, back onto the railway tracks with a field. Then where are they going to go? So we need to have something in place there, and I'd like to see that. Can I just interject there, just to because that's an important point to me as well. Um, it's not actually the builders that would build the school. A contribution will be made by the builders after certain progressions to counter, which will build the school. And I, I, I'm aware. I understand what you want, but I was thinking it can't happen. I was putting it onto the builders. I realise it's a contribution, yeah. but we need to prioritise that first. And I, I can we totally understand the ingenious way to ensure that happens. As far as I'm aware, that's down to the yeah, builders. As far as I'm aware. Before Mr. Gill comes in, the reason we made phase one and phase two together is so that the cumulative effect comes into practice 
so they can't get out of the 106 agreements? Remember, Chair, when they Gil? increased 490 houses, I was banging on about a school then and have banged on about it for numerous years, and I'm still its number one priority for them. Absolutely. Mr Gill? Thank you, Chair. Um, in essence, what will happen is that the contribution towards the school will normally be phased on the occupation, um, as the Chair has made quite clear. At the end of the day, it's down to county to when they commit to the building of it, and there's nothing we can do. With regard to your point about the builders paying up front, um, making that contribution before occupation, they, unfortunately, they need to sell the houses to make the profit, to make the contribution. And it doesn't work the other way around. You know, it, it's, uh, it's just one of those important things, but what we will do, and again, in terms of the education contribution, the obligation and the way that it is paid is a matter for county, not for us, because it will be paid direct to county. So county will agree with the developer on how that is to be paid and when it is to be paid. Thank you. Shall I carry on, Mr. Morris? I, I, I fully understand that. Um, however, I'm yet to see a poor builder, and therefore I'm pretty sure that they could afford it up front uh, without checking their accounts. Of course, I'm only guessing, shall we say, but I'm pretty sure they could. If the county councillors then can take that forward and pressure county to, to do something with that, along with our planning officers, because it is a massive key point. The schools, if you've got a thousand extra pupils going in, where are they going to go? Where, you know, we all know what the state of the schools is, so we've got to make sure that that remains a high priority. The other thing, obviously, is the doctors, uh, the doctors. Two steeples is an absolute nightmare to get an appointment now. You wait two weeks unless you're telling them you're pretty much, you're, you know, you're on your last legs and then they might see you if you're lucky. Okay, there's a cash contribution, but you're still going to be looking at 650, 1,800 more people joining two steeples. Have they got the capacity for that? Are they going to build extra, extra doctor surgeries onto the land that they've currently got? And if so, where? So that, again, the cash contribution is wonderful, but... Let's put it into practicality. 1,800 more people need their doctor's surgery in two steeples. It doesn't fit. It really doesn't. And I just interject there as well. Let's just make sure everybody understands it's not just two steeples, it's South Wigton Health Centre as well. Contribution will be split between the two. Chair, how I don't personally think it's enough that the contribution okay. how, how do we, in the two. How do we decide where the people register? And uh, South Wigston surgery, as it currently stands at this moment in time, could it cope? As it at this current time, Chair. Go there. Yeah, I know. I've been there as well, sir. I know. Um, then the the other the final part is when we talk about the loss of the habitat twenty three point two nine, and mentioned in the uh, earlier that it, it would be a contribution to the council. Would that be a monetary contribution to offset the loss of land and loss of the environmental and nat natural habitat? And if so, how do you put a price on that? And how is it priced? Because if we are losing that key area, how do you work out a price? Because, and where, where are these wildlife going to go? You know, 23.29 habitat, and you've worked it on that. But what's the price? And how, how are we putting a price on this, especially in the current climate, to point the phase of the climate change? I'll let Mr. Watterson answer that one. <laughs> Go back to your first points, Council. I hope I'll cover them all in order. You talked about traffic impact. You talked about uh, the potential for a traffic light junction on uh, Bushlow Lane, Bushlow and sorry. Um, the, as I said, there'd been quite a big auctioneering process going through. If we left it as it is, Built 650 homes plus every all the other growth going on in, in the borough. And don't forget, it's not just this development, it's everything going on in your adjoining boroughs as well, uh, across the whole of the Celts area, going back to that study. If you left it as it is, you'll have traffic backed up the way to road round about. Uh, and that's what the modelling has shown us. So you have to do something with that junction because at the moment the impact is, is too severe to accommodate as triggered uh, by the surveillance. So the traffic lights genuinely um, mitigate that issue. And they meet, and in fact, they're over accommodating the demand. And don't forget, you can only mitigate in the front of us today, you can only mitigate the demand generated by this development. You can't consider, you can consider it cumulatively, but you can't add in other developments along the way and so on and so forth. So I'm confident that, that traffic light scheme will mitigate the impact of this development and in fact, slightly over mitigate. I appreciate there's masses of traffic lights, but if you still have to put the traffic lights in to mitigate the development, 
Um, and that goes back to a, a count working really closely with county as well. So I hope that answers um, your first question. As for the, 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 the minor tweaks you talk about on um, the other two junctions, again, I'm not a highways engineer, but I'm pretty confident that after 12 months of wrangling with county and the applicant, I say wrangling, negotiating with um, with county, sorry, that was genuine slip, um, uh, discussions with the applicant, their consultants who I've worked with for maybe 15 odd years, and they're, they're local to the area, they know the patch very well, and with county and applicant, I'm really confident that the solutions we've got uh, mitigate the impacts of these schemes. And those two schemes, don't forget, had already been designed as part of the sales package. So they have been designed by county. Uh, the, the, the traffic light scheme has been designed by the applicants, consultants in conjunction working with, with county and county are very happy that the, the combination and those three schemes mitigate the impact on that local network. So I can't, uh, I can't give you advice based on, on highways and um, technicalities, but kind of beyond my professional knowledge, to be honest, but hopefully that kind of mitigates your concerns and the fears and again, um, Councillor Lloyd, you've mentioned those somewhere, you all mentioned similar, so hopefully that gives more detail on some of those matters. Um, you talked about, can you get out of it? The answer is no, that's why we've got a Section 106 agreement um, shortly. The school, the development generates a net requirement of 195 primary school places. Your secondary accommodation is absolutely fine in the area, uh, and it provides, so it provides for the financial elements, it provides for 195 pupils. Uh, there's a gap uh, that is offset uh, mostly by contributions from previous developments and there will be any difference gets made up by county to deliver that school. The trigger for that falls part of the section 106 agreement but ultimately yes uh, this applicant plus the previous contributions uh, makes a significant you know it's about 98% of that that fee that, that that build cost and not forgetting also that the applicant is throwing in 1.3 hectares of land uh, which is quite a significant that, that that's a lot of houses that aren't going on this scheme to give over to the school that's always been part of the master plan as far as a local plan provides for it and um, i might add just as a, a few extra bits and pieces the way the section 106 will be set up is that we will have a, a probably a, a stronger understanding of the cost kind of per residential unit so should the applicant come in in the future and sort of say actually with a, with, a, with a change and so on, notwithstanding that, that you may not welcome it, they are perfectly at liberty to do so, we will understand kind of the cost per unit for Section 106 contribution. So future contributions will be pro rated against the values we're creating this time. So that will be consistent in the future. Talk about doctors and uh, Councillor Walker, you also mentioned uh, doctors as well. Um, the cost as provided has been fully justified by the CCG. I can't. Uh, all Section 106 costs have to be fully justified and evidence. Uh, I asked them for more evidence. They provided the evidence, and that's the cost they've come back with for the kind of growth where we are uh, providing as part of this scheme. So I can't really, it's not really up for debate. That's a justified cost. Um, and when you talked about the, uh, the mitigation to the, 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 the lot, any potential uh, biodiversity loss on the site, uh, there is a cost of £11,000 per unit. Now that is, we talked before about the Environment Bill and recently having been enacted and it hasn't hit the planning system yet. So there's a kind of a two year, uh, we're expecting about a two year uh, wait for that to be fully implemented in terms of what will eventually become a 10% gain they'll have to achieve. We can't insist on 10, we can insist on no loss overall. We can insist on uh, some gain in there. The £11,000 figure is based on some different research. It's quite new research. It is justified, it's applicable locally. Um, it's been used in kind of uh, Warwick and Canucks, not direct, but at least in this part of the country. Um, and that's that's the best stats we've got. And that is the best information we have at this stage because it is so new. So we're using that bang up to date information. The applicant has agreed that that's a reasonable figure. It's justified, it's local, and that's the basis we're going um, ahead on. That sum, the difference uh, at the moment, like I say about 24 units, that will come to the council to ensure that they spend it in accordance with their policies to achieve that gain, to get it back into a plus situation. Um, the council is then obviously obliged in the future to have a, to have a strategy uh, to spend that money. And so the, the clawback period, uh, not entirely agreed yet, the standard would be five years. I want to work with the applicant to have a think about that to make sure it gives the council sufficient time. You will be obliged to do it anyway by law, but to make sure you've got enough time um, to take that money on board, make sure it's spent and that mitigation is implemented. And that's going to be standard across the country. That's going to be standard practice. 
developers will be pushed as hard as possible to make sure they don't have any um, net loss on their sites, but you're building on a greenfield site, so it's very, very difficult to achieve. And the balance then has to be achieved in a different way. And this is a pretty standard methodology of achieving uh, that balance. Andrew? Andrew? Was that it? For me, yeah. yeah. Councillor well, Morris, you want to come back? I just want to come back on the traffic chair. Um, like I said about the new to lane to to Lixton College at Council, absolutely that. Could that be looked at the number of crossings? Because if you look at if you count the crossings, not just the traffic lanes, you've got three crossing three crossings in in close proximity. Could we move one of them out of the way, and therefore you would still have the five lights? rather than an extra one. Because if you go to where Sainsbury is, you come up and uh, you come at the end of the alleyway where the kitchen place is, there's, cross, there's a crossing um, just further up. Then you obviously come to Roundabout, it's going to be lights there. You can bust it, you've got the pub crossing where the old doctor's surgery is. Over there, you come over it, you've got a crossing here in the school. If we could get rid of one of those, would that not benefit the area for the movement of traffic? And could that be looked at because we don't have a lot of traffic lights I'm going to put between? And is that something that can be done? Because probably can because, because you are in the way they ten yards of each other. We know we all know it's going to back up, and the highways will tell you they've done around all of these services. Oh, we know it's going to back up. Like we knew that South Brixton was going to be a car park as soon as you had about five different traffic lights in the short one road of Blade Road. So we know that's going to happen now. We're at the stage where we can discuss it rather than it's happened and we go, oh, we told you so. So is that something that can be looked at? So if you can move some of the crossings, space them out a bit further with the fact that you're going to have traffic lights at that roundabout there, it may help ease it just by the removal of one chair. One of the previous suggestions was that if we do allow this application and traffic lights are put on Long Street, um, that we do have crossings there, and that would mitigate the need for the one opposite pub. So yeah, it can be looked at, but that's down to highways. My my opinion is it would be needed. Uh, but I wouldn't still want to get rid of any of the other crossings at all. But uh, I would prefer myself, as you would, to have. Uh, Crossings at the traffic lights because it would make crossing with my dogs for one a lot safer. Okay, Councillor Lloydell. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair, for allowing me to come back. And we've talked about doctors, we've not even mentioned dentists. Um, they seem to be a thing of the past. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm coming back to the biggest problem we've got here is the traffic. Mm. The huge amount of extra cars that are going to be put on this work in a small area of, of Wigston is going to cause huge problems. It doesn't matter what counties say, the highways say about mitigating and doing all this. It's, it, it will cause huge problems. We're going to have, we have backups. Now, I remember when we were doing South Wigston and Tesco's, and then we went on to Lidl and Wicks, we were told by county, it's already congested, so a little bit more traffic won't make any difference. I remember that. And you remember that, Chair? I'm glad, I'm, I remember that. We've got congestion now. We're going to have... You can't get more congestion. You can just get more and more frustrated drivers that then look at all sorts of shortcuts and rat runs to get round it. Um, it's a serious problem. Government have set the numbers for the houses. Residents are going to pay the price. They're going to do the suffering. You've looked at mitigation. If we go down the line, and I know what Mr Gill is going to say, if we go down the line of refusing because we know the problems we're going to have with highways highways are not going to support it are they 
No, I didn't think there were. And this council will then face serious yep. repercussions and financial costs. We would lose our local plan. We give the applicant the right to appeal. All of the, uh, the conditions and notes on this application would highly likely disappear. And we would not be doing any favours whatsoever to the residents of this borough. And I, I understand, Chair. Um, we are caught between the devil and the hard place on this because as, as councillors here and residents here, we know what's going to happen. And we can do nothing because we have no support behind us just to say, you're right. Until we get the Eastern District Distributor Road, which is years in the future, we will always have this problem for Rodby and Wigston. I would like to say, though, thank you to the officers who have, they're doing so much to try and mitigate and make this work for the borough and we can only hope that some of their hard work will pay off um, and it will work. I would like to refuse but I know it, we just can't. So I expect the chair is going to remove, to remove this recommendation and with great reluctance I will on that note, on that note, as I don't have any more speakers, unless somebody else wants to say one thing. If, if I may, and, and uh, my colleagues might jump in, uh, on checking your timing, excuse. Uh, my sincere apologies, the condition seems to have slipped off the paper. There is, there was in the previous draft, a condition about timing of, of the site, which was eight to six, eight to one on. Saturday is nothing, Sunday is bank holidays. Uh, I have the word in front of me for that to read it out, but I need that to be um, part of the recommendation as well. If you could just I'll do that. Yeah, if you can just add it in the. If you'd like me to read it out, I can do. No, it's, that's not necessary. Right, so on that basis, we have no more speakers. So I will formally move the recommendation to permit, subject to the addition of the condition that's just been talked about and would ask for a seconder. Councillor Lloydell. Okay. So the application has been moved by myself with the addition of that condition, seconded by Councillor Lloydell. All those in favour of approval? That's unanimous. The application is approved. And that concludes the business of the day. Thank you very much for your attendance and good night. Thank you. you want me to give you this back? Because it